Episode 10, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Welcome to The Paradox. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson. If you're a returning listener, thank you so much for coming back, and thank you for sharing the show with your friends as the show is clearly growing. I'd like to send a shout out to my new patron, Jill Clapperth. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. And you can become a patron supporter at patreon.com slash the paradox. Every dollar that's raised at patreon.com will go towards the production and promotion of the show. I'd like to thank everyone who is bringing their friends to the show. If you're a first time listener, I think you're in for a very interesting episode. I'd also ask that you go back and listen to the last five or so episodes. They're all free. And you'll learn some different things. And we'll refer back to a couple of those episodes here in this episode, 10. I finally made it to double digits. And I'd like to send a thanks out to especially my wife, Marcy, uh, who, for whatever reason, uh, is goes along with all my crazy ideas. And when I said I wanted to create a podcast, she didn't roll her eyes. At least I didn't notice her doing that. And uh, she stuck with it and allowed me to do this. And um, it's been very supportive along the way. And so without her, this wouldn't be possible. And so I want to thank her for the, for the show. Today's episode will be with Dr. Mary Ruart. Uh, so I violated my rule to interview a physician, and I'm going to interview a PhD, a doctor uh, of biophysics. So she was also a bench scientist at Upjohn, so she knows quite a thing or two about uh, pharmaceutical development. And we're going to talk about the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, and their rules and regulations and how drugs get to market or don't get to market. And the untold cost that that comes to Americans, and I'm not talking about money, although financially there's definitely a you know, increased cost into healthcare and to you know every one of us, and I'm in the same boat as everybody else as far as increased drug costs. But also, uh, what does it actually cost us for our health and for our lives? And so we're going to get into that, which is a very interesting concept. And I think uh, early on I talk about Frederick Bastiat, and that'll be in the show notes page. And I think I have a link that's going to be make it so you can read it for free. But What is Seen and What Unseen is, a, is an excellent book. Um, Bastiat was a French philosopher, politician in the mid-19th century, uh, like 1860 or so, I think. And he goes into his economic discussion is, is on what is seen and unseen, basically that there are trade-offs, and that he discusses that there are policies that may go into place that are going to have unseen consequences. And this is the law of unintended consequences, right? You pass a law expecting one thing, and you may get what you're expecting, but you may also find something else. For instance, you raise taxes on cigarette smoking, and the revenue that you anticipated goes away because you don't have it, less people start less people are smoking. Of course, you have less people smoking, which is maybe another part of the um, the planned out uh, result of the law. However, of course, at the same time, you have less revenue, and so now the revenue expected, maybe for enforcement and smoking cessation programs, is not there, and so the policymakers then have to react and find some other way to make up for the unintended consequence in loss in revenue. So his basic premise is that there are trade-offs and unintended consequences for your actions. And in the case of the FDA, what are those intended consequences? Well, Dr. Ruart will go into talking about the problems with innovation, the obviously increased drug prices, but the length of time for drugs to make it to market, which after the 1962 amendments, which is around the time of the thalidomide controversy, which Anyone who knows a little bit about the drugs is probably familiar with the story of thalidomide and the birth defects that it caused in Europe primarily because the drug had not yet been approved in the United States for use. And so because of these new amendments, the length of the drug would take to get to market would go from 4 to 14 years. And the way this affects you and me is now there are 10 years extra that are in development costs, so the cost of drugs are more. And of course, the time, the time is the, if it's a life-saving drug, it's prevented 10 years worth of people having access to that medication that may change your life as far as a chemotherapy agent, maybe it lowers blood pressure, maybe it cures heart attacks or strokes or Parkinson's or something. You can imagine all sorts of different problems and afflictions people have that they no longer have access to these drugs. And we'll tell a couple of those stories during the episode. I think you'll find it very interesting. It's a great book that she wrote, and that'll be linked in the show notes page as well. 
It's called death by regulation. It's you can obviously tell her angle for the um, for the FDA. And today's show notes page will be at theparadox.com slash zero ten. So let's go ahead and jump right in. This is the discussion with Dr. Mary Ruart. Enjoy the show. So thank you so much for joining us. This is Dr. Eric Larson, your host for The Paradox, and I'm joined today by my guest, Dr. Mary Ruart. Now, Dr. Ruart, like on episode three, I have a non-physician. However, she is a doctor. She has a doctorate for a PhD in biophysics. And Dr. Ruart has written a very interesting book called Death by Regulation, where she discusses the role the FDA has in drug development and uh, approval process. And so we'd like to discuss that today. And Dr. Ruart received her biochemistry uh, bachelor's at Michigan State University, as well as her doctorate in, I believe, is biophysics. And she worked at Upjohn for almost 20 years, uh, which was, I think, based in Kalamazoo. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. And so we're going to discuss your book, which I have to say, uh, I wouldn't ordinarily recommend a book about drug manufacturing because I wouldn't think that'd be very interesting <laughs> for the lay public. But I found it very fascinating. And I, um, and so I want to talk about a lot of the 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 things you touched on in the book, because I think it'd be very useful for people who are both in medicine to sort of understand the problems we have in the drug development, costs certainly, and process, but also uh, for people who are, you know, just patients and or have family members who are receiving medications, because this affects your life, even though you probably don't realize it. Would you think that's a pretty fair assessment? Yes. We've each lost about five to 10 years of our lives to the amendments that were passed in 1962 to the Food and Drug Act. So that's pretty much affecting us all. Yeah. <laughs> and and so I'd like to, to point out, this is sort of like talking about, um, if you're familiar with Frederick Bastiat, he's a French philosopher and uh, I guess he's a politician also in the mid-19th century. And he wrote extensively on Oh, politics and economics, but one of his one of his books that he wrote, which is a fairly easy to to read and it's quick read, I guess I'd say, is called "What Is Seen and Unseen." And it's sort of the it's it's base it's a very simple concept. It's there's a trade off that you have in life, um, and oftentimes you may not you obviously don't know what the outcome would have been had you made a different decision, right? And so, a lot of this book, I think, sort of goes along those lines, right? There's what did we lose or not have because of certain rules were put in place. And so that's what we're going to kind of talk about today. But I want to have people have that in the back of their minds that, that you know, a lot of what we're talking about is, of course, in some ways theoretical, because you can never know what you, what you didn't have, but by making a certain decision. And the best way to describe this is if you go to the, the grocery store and you buy hot dogs, you'll never know what it would have been like to eat hamburgers that night. Likewise, had you bought hamburgers, you never would have known what it would be hot dogs. And so you can only make the, those choices. And so... If, there's, if the choice is not available to you, you would never know if you went to the grocery store and they'd even offer hamburgers, you wouldn't even know what it was like, right? But perhaps that would have been a healthier choice or, you know, whatever. And so that's sort of what we're, that's kind of a lot of what the book is about. Would you, is that, again, is that a fair assessment for the book, do you think? Yes. Although I have to say, because we've studied the pharmaceutical industry so intensively, we actually can get a pretty good idea of what would have happened without the amendments. And that's why I wrote the book, because I think it's it's very hard for anyone who wasn't in the industry when these amendments were really getting their teeth, so to speak. Um, it would be very hard for them to see this because it's basically invisible to most of the public and even researchers and uh, journalists who want to learn about this. It's, it's a very... Um, complex and, and largely hidden action, you know, behind the scenes. And and because I was behind the scenes and was part of the industry uh, during the time when the amendments were kicking in, I, I can speak to this in a way that a lot of people can't. So this is why I wrote the book. I, I feel people should be aware that regulations, bad regulations can be just as deadly as bad drugs. Right. And so, and so what you're referring to specifically is, and, and, you know, when I talked to my father and I said, you know, we're, I'm going to be talking about the FDA and sort of the, what the effects of regulations might be. He said, oh, you mean like thalidomide, right? So my, my father's a physician, retired now. And that's, that's what he remembers because that, that was the issue where the um, medication was made available and it was approved. And in Europe, women were taking this who were pregnant and then it would cause birth defects, right? And, and, and so- that that in some way provided the momentum to to allow the FDA a little bit more latitude in sort of how they 
um, how they regulate the dr- development of medications and, and their approval process in the United States. Do you want to just kind of go through just briefly kind of how that all happened? Because that is the law we're talking about today that still affects the current process in 2018. Yes. Yes. Well, thalidomide was actually um, put on the market initially as a sleeping aid, and it, which was much safer than barbiturates. Many people at that time were dying of barbiturate overdose, accidental overdose. And thalidomide was safer in that respect for adults. But what happened is pregnant women started taking it because they recognized that it also uh, kept their morning sickness in check. And so the company then marketed it for that. And back in those days, we were not as aware of the effects that drugs could have on the unborn, even if the mothers were fine with the drug. And so many babies in Europe, I think the neighborhood of 10,000 babies were born either without limbs, you know, uh, without a limb or two, I should say, or died. And so this drug was never approved in the US. It was being tested, but the FDA had some questions about it, so they hadn't approved it. So the FDA already had enough power to stop it from coming into the United States. But Life Magazine did a big expose on thalidomide, and Congress decided it needed to pass something to reassure the American public. And the amendments had been actually floating around Congress for about three years before this, and they were never intended to improve safety. What they were intended to do was demonstrate effectiveness of generic medications. And so the, drug, the amendments that were passed to prevent uh, this thalidomide tragedy from ever visiting the United States were not only unnecessary because the FDA already had the power, but they really didn't even address the safety problem. And consequently, as I show in my book, the withdrawal rate from of drugs that were approved by the FDA and then had to be taken back because they, sh- they turned out to be deadly or had devastating side effects. The the percentage of drugs that we withdraw from the market didn't really change before and after the amendments. In fact, after the amendments, it was actually bigger. So there isn't wasn't really any good safety coming from these amendments, and there wasn't even any increase in effectiveness, uh, except maybe about ten percent increase in effectiveness. And as we'll see as we talk more these amendments were very deadly. So they didn't do what they were supposed to do in the first place, but they created a lot more problems. Right. And so I think it's important to to point out that we're not discussing... So the bill, this legislation passed under the auspices of that it would improve safety, but essentially what it did is focus more on effectiveness of medications, right? And so... And as you point out early in your book, what is an effective medication is really complicated because... You essentially, and I always talk this with patients that you know medication is either zero percent or one hundred percent effective, right? In many ways, it either works or doesn't work for someone, and so I don't know which one you are. Um, and especially as we move into different medication types, like ones that are focused specifically on genetic markers for like chemotherapeutic agents, uh, that maybe a certain um, marker is uh, for a certain type of breast cancer will be responsive to a certain therapeutic chemotherapeutic agent. Obviously if you don't have that marker, it's 0% effective. And so you can do all the studies you want on just a general population, it'll be useless. But it might be 100% effective for that person who has the right marker, right? And so and so it it there's a lot of vagueness and sort of um, difficulty sort of defining what, what we're actually testing if we're at the FDA. And it might be somewhat arbitrary, right? And so that's, I think, important for people to recognize that the effectiveness is a very loose term. Yes. In fact, the Supreme Court in the early 1900s uh, ruled that it was a matter of opinion. (laughs) And so (laughs) they felt that that should not have to be part of the labeling process. Obviously, the amendments totally overthrew that judgment. Right. And so I I think, um, I'm not sure where to start with this, but I think we'll go with, we'll talk about uh, some effectiveness drugs and how the FDA has a there was actually a recent movie, The Dallas Buyers Club, where they talked about uh, patients who had AIDS, and this is in the early it was the eighties, probably right when AIDS was first um, sort of hitting the scene, and um, there was not much treatment. <clears throat> it was sort of a death sentence for most people, but there were therapies that were found to be effective or believed to be effective in other countries and availability, uh, like in Mexico, 
And so people would arrange ways of getting around the FDA approval process because the FDA was very slow in sort of um, in sort of allowing these medications to come to market. And so why don't you talk about the AIDS epidemic? Because I think that's the first example of a of a of people just sort of dealing with it. And and certainly there are a lot of lives and a lot of morbidity that came about because of the FDA's slowness in approval. Yes. Well, you know, before the amendments were passed, it took about four years to get a drug from the lab bench to the marketplace. After the amendments, that number increased. And by the time the AIDS epidemic hit, it was about 14 years. So the amendments had added about 10 years to development time. And the AIDS patients knew they couldn't wait. So not only did they import drugs from other countries, but they hired black market chemists to make the very drugs that the pharmaceutical firms were working on, and they distributed them throughout the AIDS community. So by the time the FDA finally gave us permission to test them in people, all the AIDS patients in the country who wanted them had already had them and had become (laughs) resistant. And so we had to wait for new patients to be diagnosed before we could do the FDA mandated studies. And of course, if your listeners saw the Dallas Buyers Club, they saw that these Buyers Club that were distributing these drugs from overseas, uh, a lot of nutritional products, and the drugs that we were working on in the pharmaceutical industry, um, you, you saw that these people were prosecuted and persecuted uh, and 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 also, what was remarkable is that many of these people survived because of what they got from the buyers' club, uh, long past the time when they were expected uh, to still be around. So the buyers' clubs were actually doing a pretty good job. They also kept track of the safety data and let people know what the possible side effects were. They they did quite a good job actually, and so. It's it's really sad to see that the FDA was, you know, basically going after these sick people, but it only did it in certain areas where the buyers clubs were isolated, like in the instance in Texas. Right. In California, they pretty much left them alone because they knew that these people were strong activists and that they would you know, make it clear to everyone that the foot dragging by the FDA was responsible for not getting these drugs to them sooner. Right. And, and so it's, again, it's very, it's a, it's a, I guess it's a political sort of issue for the FDA in many ways, right? It's that they want to, yes. that their actions are, I, I mean, their actions are ostensibly for safety and effectiveness of medications. However, there is a heavy dose of, um, Oh, I guess rear end covering, right? As far as uh, some sort of drug may come to market that may cause a problem, or if people are getting things outside of the the system, there it delegitimizes their existence, right? And so they're always ba- they're always trying to balance uh, how effective that they can be uh, with in going after people because they want to make sure that they maintain le- le- legitimacy, and also they don't want to get hauled in front of Congress because something some drug comes you know out and it some weird. You know, reaction happens that no one anticipated, and now they're blamed because they, they approved something, right? So that by the very nature, they're going to be very slow in coming out uh, in favor of and allowing a drug to come to market. Yes, that's right. You know, the the amendments actually change the way that the FDA is held responsible for new drugs. So before the amendments, drug companies would submit all their data to get a drug approved, and if the FDA didn't complain or ask for more studies in six months, they could market the drug. But with the amendments, somebody at the FDA actually had to sign off on the approval and put their head in the proverbial noose. And if anything went wrong, and of course, all drugs have side effects, Mm -hmm. though there's definitely the possibility that some side effect will come to the attention of the American public. And if that happened, then whoever signed off on it uh, would, of course, uh, <laughs> be criticized by Congress and could even lose their job, at least in theory. Right. So, uh, you know, the FDA is very risk averse. And so it just keeps thinking up more and more studies that the drug companies have to do. And that's why the timeline increased from four to 14 years. But it also, even though it's kind of leveled off now at about 13 years, Still, the costs of doing these studies have increased and continue to increase exponentially every year. 
And so this is very disturbing because if you look at the comparison between what we pay at the pharmacy for a brand new drug and what the costs of research and development are, you see there's a direct correlation. For those of your listeners who are technically inclined, it's an R squared of 0.94, which is about as good as you're going to get in real life. So basically, the pricing that we're seeing at the pharmacy is being driven by the increasing costs of these regulations. Right. And and so, you know, a quick, quick and simple way of thinking about it is a previous approval rating time was three or four years and now it's 12 you've tripled you've tripled the the time and so clearly you've tripled the cost i mean it's you know you're going to get a large increase in the the cost of new medications that make to market because the approval process just takes so long and it's so much more involved and i mean i'm not i'm not going to i will defend pharmaceutical companies where they need to be defended i think there's certainly things that they are involved in that um that are that are reasons to be concerned However, it's very it's very real that they have to do research development. They have to do these studies. I mean, we're seeing studies and medications that are very beneficial that are today. I mean, I would that are still being prevented from making to market. And, and I, as an anesthesiologist, I'll mention just one example. So, Sugamidex is a medication that reverses neuromuscular blockade. So, if you when you go for anesthesia and you go under general anesthetics, oftentimes you're paralyzed or getting given neuromuscular blocker. Uh, it's a non-depolarizing agent. And then anyway, that will stop your muscles from moving. And so that's to allow the anesthesiologist time to place the breathing tube successfully into you and to start the case. And it's very routine. Uh, the problem with that is the medications that we use can last a few minutes and there's no way to reverse the effects of those drugs. Well, you'd say, why would you need to reverse the effects in you know a minute and a half? Well, what if you try to put the breathing tube in more unsuccessful? So what you'd hope to do is you'd hope the per- that the patient could wake up and they can start breathing again on their own because they'd be the, and then you don't have, uh, and you know, because if they're not breathing, obviously it's a very short surgery, right? And, and it's incredibly dangerous. So having a medication that could reverse that medic could reverse the, the paralysis right away would be potentially life-saving for a number of individuals. And so we, so that medication was available in Europe for a number of years. I'm not sure how long, but as three or four years I've been reading about it in my literature, but the FDA just kept blocking it and blocking it, it would not allow it. And then they approved it and then they took it back and it just another six months or a year was, and I don't think thousands of people died because of this, but there, I mean, there certainly was a lot of, there's probably some harm that came to people because this medication, which has been, as far as we can tell, after it's been out for a couple of years and far more in Europe, is incredibly, is safe. I mean, obviously, it has side effects like you mentioned, like every medication does. But there are potentially some lives lost or people are harmed because this medication was prevented from being used on patients here in the United States. I mean, we always think of the United States as a free market, wheeling, you know, freewheeling kind of country, where, and Europe's the one with the heavy regulations and nothing ever can do. However, there are all these new medicines that seem to be arriving in Japan and Europe before they make it here. I mean, it, are these U.S. Mm-hmm. companies doing there, or are they just testing over there, or how does exactly? I mean, just talk about the different approval rate processes because I think most people think the U.S. is the most free as far as an e- economy, when that's clearly not the case. If this, if this is what's going on, yes. Well, most of the innovation takes place in the United States, or did, um, and what happened in the company I was in is after the amendments started taking effect and lengthening the development time, we did our first studies overseas because we could get in and we could learn about the drug and get it approved over there. And then we could do the more onerous studies here in the U.S. with some knowledge behind us. So that's that's what we started doing. And the, the... you know, it's it's gotten so bad that even the Department of Defense this last year put in its budget that it wanted to have the approval power for drugs that were used on the battlefield because the FDA had been dragging <laughs> its feet and approving plasma for use on the battlefield. Um, you know, the U.S. <laughs> developer had a much better product. It was in plastic bags, which is what you want instead of glass on the battlefield. But we were having to buy from France the plasma in glass. Well, that that's ridiculous because obviously if we, you know, on a battlefield, we don't want to be carrying something that could break and, and create more problems. <laughs> and 
<laughs> I know it's, it's, I mean, even another government agency recognizes that the FDA is too slow. And they compromised and decided that, the, you know, the DOD and the FDA would meet and work this out. Well, we'll see next year if they haven't worked it out. Because the FDA said it was going to be a couple of years yet before they could approve this plasma product for use on the battlefield. This is very similar to what you're talking about. And, and the thing about it is when you delay innovation, and delay life-saving drugs getting to the market, people die. You know, just from the four to 14 year timeline, you can actually calculate how many people have lost their lives because we have an estimate of how many people today's drugs save. And that estimate's about 15 million people. That's about 10 times as many people that have died in all the wars since our country's founding. That's a huge number. Yeah. And then if you look at loss of innovation and do a very conservative estimate based on studies that have been done and that show that about half of our drugs that, that go into human testing drop out in mid or late phase development because they're economically unfeasible, which means the company knows they're going to be losers. <laughs> right. Uh, because of the great cost of development, uh, you can you can actually calculate about 27 million people have lost their lives because of this loss of innovation. And I have to stress, this is a very conservative estimate. It's based on these lost drugs being only 25% as effective <laughs> as the ones we have today. Right. And so, you know, that's how you end up getting to the place where each of us have lost five to 10 years of our lives. The five, it's about 5.5 years for the numbers I've just talked about. And the biggest loss of life almost for certain is the way the amendments shifted our medical paradigm from inexpensive prevention to expensive treatment. I can't give right. a number based on that because we don't have enough studies to show, but I would imagine that that is equivalent or greater to the numbers that I just suggested. Uh, so in your book, Death by It Regulation, you have an interesting story in chapter 14 where you talk about aspirin. Everyone is very, everyone's familiar with aspirin. Probably everybody listening to this has used aspirin at some point in their life and initially developed for pain, right? I mean, it was for arthritis and um, and it was discovered at some point by a pharmaceutical company. And I'm not sure, I think you have it listed in your book, which one, uh, discovered that aspirin would be a good way of preventing a heart attack. It is current, um, I guess it's current protocol is what you'd say, that you take an aspirin if you think you're having a heart attack. And that's in, that's in ACLS. I mean, it's, it's like, it's very common knowledge that you take that to help break, break up the clots because we know that everyone, I think most people are familiar that aspirin can cause you to be a little, to bleed more, more likely to bleed. And so it helps break up with its actions. It breaks up clots. And so if you have a clot forming in one of your arteries in your heart that causes a heart attack, that aspirin has been shown to help break that up and allow you to get uh, more normal flow to your heart and then prevent the damage, the ischemic damage to your heart. So the FDA, because even though pharmaceutical companies knew this, they were unable to tell people about it because it's a generic drug, it costs nothing, right? I mean, pretty much. And so there was no incentive. There's a disincentive, I guess, to, what I'd say to telling the public and to tell physicians and to tell everybody that this could potentially save lives, right? Can you go into that story? Sure, sure. Well, you know, in the mid 60s, uh, I think it was Bear Aspirin uh, wanted to put out a, a special one a day pack of aspirin to prevent heart attacks and, you know, to, you know, do the things that we knew it could do. Or at least when I say we knew it could do, we had a pretty good indication from some studies that this would be so. And when they talked to the FDA and said, okay, under the 1962 amendments, what do we have to do to get this drug to market and, and have, be able to advertise it for heart attack prevention? And basically when the FDA told them, they said, this is ridiculous. You know, we're not going to be able to do this because it is a generic drug. Everyone can use our studies to sell the drug. And, you know, we can't spend that much money to do this and, and think that we're going to recover our development costs. And so it wasn't until the late 80s when there was a study of physicians 
that was supposed to go on, I believe, for 10 years, but they stopped it after five because they were seeing such a great prevention of heart attacks in the doctors that were in the study group that they decided it would be unethical to continue to give some of the people placebo. Right. <laughs> so, so they stopped that. And then, of course, it became uh, became more common knowledge that this was something that one should do. But basically, the American public lost, I think I calculated 1.7 million lives based on the information that we now have about aspirin, because this information was not readily available and not all physicians knew about it until the late 80s. Right. And so, and so when you, we talk about, when you mentioned you know, death by regulation, this is what we're talking about, right? This is, these are the peop- the lives that are lost. And again, it's because just no one knew, but it's because of prevention of prevention of the dissemination of knowledge by the FDA, by the regulatory uh, uh, power that it has. It essentially suppress this information from people. I mean, I'm sure if you talk to anyone from the FDA, they say, well, absolutely not. We'd never tell people to not to, you know, talk about these sort of things. Uh, well, you know, now that it's been out, but the effect of the regulation and, and the way they're risk averse and the way that they force you to have uh, new studies for any time you make a new claim about a drug that may be already established, right? So that's sort of what we're talking about here, that it makes it, it makes it, you just can't do it. Well, that's right. And it's not just drugs, it's foods too. For example, diamond walnuts and uh, many of the cherry growers started putting studies up on their website that had been published in scientific journals talking about the benefits of the things that were contained in cherries and walnuts. And the FDA told them, uh, sent them warning letters. You can actually access them on the FDA's website, uh, telling them that because they were telling people that their foods could have benefits, uh, that these health benefits made the food a drug and had to go through all of the regulatory testing that a drug did. Well, of course, you know, no food grower is going to be able to afford that. So they just stopped telling people about the benefits of their food. But the problem is that diamond walnuts actually got sued and actually had to pay quite a bit of money for false advertising based on that. So it's really, it's really sad. Right. I mean, I mean, I remember at some point Cheerios on the back side of their box, something about, you know, what was cholesterol by eating whole oats or something like that. And then that sort of disappeared, but that was probably the, the FDA as well, right? Stepping in and saying. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so the FDA just, you know, it actually went to court over this. And it turned out that the courts agreed with the FDA that if you make a health claim for food, uh, that it becomes a drug. So in other words, if you wanted to sell bottled water and say, this would help you with dehydration if you're out in the desert, you know, you, would, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to make that claim without running afoul of the FDA. Yeah. yeah, that'd be an interesting study. Okay, you don't drink water and you drink water for two days. We'll see who does yeah. that. I mean, everybody knows you need water to live. Everyone knows you need food to live. So should we be surprised that there are health benefits to food and water? No. Right. (laughs) That's how ridiculous it is. But you see, in a way, okay, now just to take it from the FDA standpoint, um, you know, so, so the problem is they've been told they can't let anything on the market or any health claims on the market without all of this scientific information. Right. And so- If they let food manufacturers, I'm sure this is the way they feel, if they let food manufacturers or supplement manufacturers make health claims without having to go through the regulatory process and they make the drug manufacturers do that, then that becomes difficult because there's a lot of crossover between drugs and nutrients. Most people don't realize it, but most drugs have a chemical structure very close or sometimes identical to what is already in the body. Mm -hmm. And so this is why it gets very complicated. And, you know, you probably, probably you and your listeners, of course, have heard about fish oil and all the great benefits. And so some manufacturers decided that they would find a way to make fish oil a prescription drug. What they did is they put an extra chemical group on the fish oil chemistry. And so when you're, when you take prescription fish oil, that chemical group gets taken off and you have, you know, the fish oil components that you want. But of course, because they went through the regulatory process, 
the copay just on the prescription fish oil, just the copay is actually more or equivalent to what you would pay for high grade over the counter fish oil. Sure. And there's some over the counter fish oil that's even more pure than the prescription fish oil. But the person who has that certainly would not be allowed to go to doctors and tell them that without running, uh, you know, a foul of the FDA. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's the kind of craziness we have going on when we have a natural product that is so beneficial that it gets turned into a drug. Right. And, and this kind of goes to along uh, later in the book where you t- t- spoke about folate and, um, and neural tube defects. And I'll just let you kind of tell the story, and then, because it neural tube defects, spina bifida, where the the um, the the I guess you'd say the spinal canal doesn't close properly, can cause serious problem, health problems later if the the infant is born without it closing, prowl or you know unable to use their limbs and all sorts of things, uh, and so we've discovered at some point, someone discovered, I guess I should say that folic acid was in some way responsible for the proper development of the of the neural tube. So go into sort of how the FDA got into that and then also ran afoul of the CDC. I think it's a really funny story. Yes. Well, actually it's, it's, I mean, you have to, you have to laugh or you'll cry because it's a very tragic story. Gallows the humor. Am- yes. Right. <laughs> yes. The amendments were passed to prevent something like thalidomide happening in the U S but Actually, they created what I call the American thalidomide, which is what you were referring to in terms of folate and folic acid. So in the early 1980s, it became apparent from scientific publications that almost 100% of neural tube defects could be prevented if a woman was taking folic acid or folate is the preferred form today um, in the first month or two of pregnancy. Of course, that's when she probably doesn't know she's pregnant. So she needs to be taking it all the time to make sure that when she does conceive, there isn't a problem. And as you said, these neural tube defects are very, very tragic. Uh, Many of the children die from them or they end up institutionalized. And many more are aborted because you can test for this in utero. Right. So... The folic acid manufacturers obviously wanted to tell the American public about this so that women could take folic acid and protect themselves. But the FDA told them that they would be prosecuted if they did that because that's a health claim and they hadn't gone through all the years of the regulatory red tape. And then in the early 90s, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, another government agency, started recommending that young women take folic acid regularly. And the FDA told the folic acid manufacturers that if they even talked about the Center for Disease Control's claim, that they would prosecute them. (laughs) And so... It wasn't really, and then, and then, so the CDC is making this recommendation. The FDA knows very well that folic acid will prevent these birth defects. So then it required uh, grain manufacturers, or or, uh, I should say manufacturers of grain products like cereal and bread to fortify their products with folic acid. (sighs) And of course, then the young women don't know if they're getting enough because you know, they don't generally try to add up all their folic acid (laughs) that they're eating with these products. And so it didn't really help very much. In other countries where manufacturers were able to advertise the benefits of folic acid or folate, what ended up happening is the young women went from taking only about 17, I'm sorry, 7% of them, for example, were taking folic acid after all this advertising was close to 60 or 70%. So those women were protected. But in the US, of course, that didn't happen. And that means we probably had somewhere between 10,000 and 20,000 babies either born with neural tube defects, aborted, uh, you know, or otherwise compromised because the women weren't taking folic acid and they this is very inexpensive, so they probably would have had they known, had they been allowed to advertise. Right. And so essentially you had two government agencies that were at odds with each other. You had the Center for Disease Prevention that was saying, 
you have to take folic acid if you're a young woman because you you'll be before you know you're pregnant, you that's when the neural tur- tube forms. If you have the folic acid, it prevents this devastating problem. And the FDA said, well, yeah, but they've <laughs> they've never proven this in studies, so we're going to disallow you from actually using the CDC's recommendation. Which you're almost re- you know it's crazy to think that you can't use with the FDA the one of the government agency recommends, and they're pitting against each other. And then so the FDA, knowing this was the case, still insisted then. That well, we're going to put it in surreptitiously in all the grains, and so we use our other arm where we kind of control drugs, or I'm sorry, foods, and make sure that the vitamins, the nutrients are there. And then, in a further twist, I would say recently, with the last year or so, there seems to be a decent amount of evidence that too much folic acid during in utero has led to increase in food allergies. And so, in some ways, you're almost maybe getting too much folic acid, right? There's probably a, I don't know if there's a, maybe a sweet spot for folic acid, but that the FDA, because it suppressed that and then forced all these manufacturers to put folic acid in food, the folic acid is still there. And now you have people taking the supplements, which has more folate. And so now maybe you're getting more food allergies, right? So you, you maybe have caused, you've, you know, I can't even describe how <laughs> it's a circuitous sort of path, but we end up maybe in even extra worse shape than we were before. Not only did you have the defects before, but now maybe we have allergy, food allergy problems with all kinds of kids you see. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a very complex thing. And again, um, certainly supplements are much safer than drugs uh, because our body can handle them better because they are part of our body, right? There's something the body's used to seeing. It makes it, in, in some cases, not in the vitamin case necessarily, but you know, uh, the body makes some of these natural substances that we take as supplements. Sure. But as with everything, too much yeah, right. <laughs> of a good thing can be bad. I mean, we, can, we need water to live, but we can also drown in it. So. Exactly, right. <laughs> And care needs to be taken, you know, and of course, our, our level of scientific knowledge, unfortunately, is such, especially with supplements that we, and, and even drugs, really, we really, we really don't have all the information. And we may be one of the people who are sensitive sure. to the drug right. or the nutrient. So there's no sure thing. We have to pay attention to our bodies to a large extent and see how we feel on these things. And, and you know, there is a randomness to life that you can't uh, account for. And that's sort of, you know, that's just life, I guess you'd say, because, you know, why someone gets cancer and another person doesn't, they, their lives are otherwise entirely the same. And they're just, it's just for whatever reason, you have bad luck, I guess is one way to put it. So let's talk about Vioxx. And Vioxx is a COX-2 inhibitor, which is basically just like, it's like a, I guess you say it's like aspirin, except that it doesn't cause the um, ulceration problems for stomach ulcers. And so that's why these COX-2 inhibitors were in, uh, developed to help people with inflammatory problems, mainly arthritis as you get older. And so Vioxx was approved by the FDA. It did everything it was supposed to do. And it was not too long afterwards that people recognized that there were some problems with Vioxx and still the FDA did nothing, although it's charged with safety for the American public. Well, actually, there was some evidence even before it was approved that Vioxx could be increasing the incidence of heart attacks. And David Graham, one of the FDA examiners, went to his supervisor and said, hey, you know, this is this is dangerous. And that was because there was a study done with Vioxx and another compound. And what the study showed is that the Vioxx group had more heart attacks. But the problem is when you are working on something for close to 14 years, it, it's almost like your child. <laughs> yeah, right. and, and of course, you don't want to think anything bad about your child. So the company said, oh, it's not that Biox is creating more heart attacks. It's, it's uh, this other compound is protecting against heart attacks. Uh, that did not turn out to be the case, but certainly you can see that we all have a human tendency to protect what's ours, right? So so when you're 14 years working on something, you want to find anything that will change the way you think about it. And so one of the problems with this long development time is that it makes the manufacturer very hesitant to say, oh, this is, this is a bad drug after 12 years, let's throw it away. Right. So 
And of course, if it was just four years, like it used to be, it would be a little easier to do that. And there would also be probably other options as well, because when you spend as much money on drug development as we do today, there isn't much money left over for another choice if you find out something bad. Anyhow, David Graham went to his supervisor and said, you know, this drug is, you know, probably bad and we shouldn't approve it. And what happened is his supervisor said, well, you know, the drug companies are our client now. And this is, he said that because in 92, there was the Prescription Drug User Fee Act passed, whereby the drug companies paid the FDA for quicker reviews. And by the time that Vioxx was in the mix, about a half of the salaries of the FDA section that approved drugs was paid for through these user fees. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it really shifted the FDA's attitude. So the FDA clearly has a conflict of interest now in approving drugs. And so Vioxx was approved. And it was the manufacturer that took it off the market eventually when it became convinced that, hey, this is bad. And of course, the manufacturer suffered for that bad drug because it was sued. And if you total up all the settlements and all of the problems that occurred, you can see that they paid out much more in damages than they ever made on Vioxx. And so it, it doesn't make sense for a company to put a bad drug on the market knowingly, and most of them won't. But again, getting back to this huge timeline and this reluctance because of this huge timeline to believe anything bad about your drug, we, we really, once again, are putting bad incentives in place. And for the FDA, too, because now the drug industry is paying a lot of their salaries, creating a conflict of interest. And, and actually, there's no way that the FDA is handling this conflict of interest. So this is, this is a really big problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can look at this and say, I, there's clearly, well, it's well known that people move from the regulatory bodies to industry and back and forth. Because on some of it makes a lot of sense, right? If you want someone who's going to regulate on mining, it helps to have someone who has some knowledge of mining, right? You don't want someone who's an architect to make develop regulations about mining or vice versa. Uh, however, it, it, as you get people moving back and forth from industry and to um, the government regulatory bodies, then you have the government regulatory bodies funded by those set in organizations or you know, companies. It, the decision-making obviously becomes very complex and very political and very, you know, there are financial want decisions that are made that you wouldn't ordinarily think. And so I think people assume that the regulatory bodies utmost goal is safety and efficacy and those sorts of things, but it, it may, it may very well not be. I mean, I'm, again, I'm not saying there's anything particularly unusually bad about the FDA in this sense or the people there, except that they respond to incentives as does anybody else. Right. And so if you set up kind of a system that's, that, is, that has bad incentives or confusing ones, you're going to get bad outcomes and confusing outcomes, much like, you know, folic acid or Vioxx and these sorts of things. That's right. And Vioxx was probably the most deadly drug that was ever put on the market in the U.S. Um, and, you know, this revolving door that you were talking about, this really didn't happen much before the amendments. But right after the amendments already, you know, before 10 years had passed, that became a very prominent feature of the drug industry and regulatory landscape for just the reasons that you mentioned. Because if you want to deal with the FDA, uh, and you have to deal with the FDA, you need to be very careful how you do it. Because if the FDA gets upset with you as a company representative or as a company, it can delay every step of the process in the drug approvals. And that can cost millions of dollars. In fact, it can put a company out of business. And there have been companies bankrupted because of the continuing demands of the FDA and the foot dragging. So this is not some theoretical concern. This is a real concern that drug companies have. Right. And so you can you can imagine that if you're a congressman and you've retired, it would be useful for a pharmaceutical company or any company to hire you and say, "Hey, I want you to you've you were sat on some regulatory board or um, a committee that oversaw the FDA. You know people there. We want you to to maintain our relations with that organization because 
if you keep everything night moving smoothly, it's going to help our approval process, which is worth, you know, I don't know what we're paying you, but it could be worth hundreds of millions of dollars at stock prices and those sorts of things. If we can get this direct to market and you can save us two years I and mean, you can imagine the, the difference in cost and, you know, savings for the, the, the company. And so I think that, you know, that's why you get these sort of arrangements. I, mm-hmm. I'd like to touch on the combination drugs because this I think is real interesting. It's one I had never really considered before because in the armamentarium that I have at my disposal as anesthesiologist, I don't, I, I don't really ever use combination drugs. I can't, I, maybe I do, and I'm just not thinking one right now. Um, only, I guess I would say the only ones I use for when I, we combine medications for uh, running epidurals and things like that, but we have a, a opioid and then also a local anesthetic, but combination drugs are not really allowed by the FDA, right? Because now you've, you make it take two separate medications that you have approval of. And then if you combine them, the FDA say, well, well, you can't do that. In practice, people will have them take both of them anyway, right? And so you do. So you you take this pill, you take this pill, Mr. Smith. And well, be maybe it would be nice if they were just together, but we're not going to, because they're, maybe there's a side effect that one has that is beneficial to the other one and helpful. And I think you make the point with Tylenol. Could you sort of talk about that and just the topic in general? Sure, sure. Well, actually, what happened is once the amendments were passed, the FDA asked the National Academy of Sciences to evaluate drugs that were already on the market and help it decide if they had enough evidence of effectiveness. And there was a big debate going on at that time whether combination antibiotics should be allowed or not. Uh, The bad news about combination drugs of any kind is that Every drug has a side effect. If you combine them, you would expect twice as many side effects, right? Right. But on the on the plus side, combination antibiotics, especially back then, uh, probably saved lives. And the reason is that back then our technology wasn't that good, so we couldn't rapidly tell what drug we needed to put that particular bacteria or infectious agent to bed, so to speak. Uh, So sometimes combination antibiotics were given and probably saved lives because had, had the wrong drug been given the first time, the wrong antibiotic, and it didn't work, and then you give the second one, you may have lost the time you need to save the patient. The other problem was that when you didn't know what drug was needed, and you did a sequential uh, test or a sequential dosing of your patient, you increase the chances that next time they would be, um, you know, that the, the remaining bacteria would be resistant and that drug wouldn't help them anymore. When you give a combination antibiotic, it's harder for the bacteria to become resistant to both or either of them. In fact, today, when we treat AIDS patients, we give combination drugs because we know that it makes it much more difficult for the virus to become um, resistant. And the same is true for bacteria. So the FDA basically said, okay, if you have a combination drug and it doesn't work better than either, um, than each drug would additively, then we're not going to allow it. And so I think about 10% of the, uh, how can I say this? Um, the antibiotics were taken off the market that were combinations, and it really wiped out about 10% of the revenue for the drug companies, and in some cases more than that. So the drug companies felt like this was very unfair because they didn't get to have a court hearing. They tried, they sued for it, but the the courts ruled that if the FDA had to be challenged in court every time it refused to approve something, then it would be uh, tied up in <laughs> courts forever. And so right. it said, no, there can be no challenges. After that, drug companies were hesitant to do combination products because the FDA would make them test each component separately and then both of them together. And that basically tripled their costs. Right. So it just wasn't feasible. Right. And finally, we look at more innovative, and I touched this very early on, but when you look at more innovative ways of treating disease, and I, you know your your book, you mentioned stem cell therapy, which is um, 
a little bit different than focusing on certain genetic factors, but essentially it's kind of the same, right? You're, you're developing almost an individualized treatment for a disease for a patient. And the examples you use in the book is with ALS or um, amyotrophic uh, lateral sclerosis, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, which is, you know, a, a death sentence. As soon as some people get that, they slowly your muscles break down. They aren't able to function. Eventually you sort of suffocate and die. And, and that people have used stem cell therapy to treat this. So there are two parts. Is one is this is someone who has no chance of living anyway. And so I know Trump just passed or signed into law uh, just recently um, a bill allowing people to, if everything's if they're I can't remember the terminology, but it right to try right to right try to right, to right to try legislation. So basically, you can if you're if you have a terminal illness, you can do whatever you want. I guess is on, but I imagine there are some restrictions to that as well. Uh, and then. Yes. And then uh, the other thing is, how does the FDA go about verifying effectiveness of a medication that is specific for one patient, right? So Yeah, it's very difficult. In fact, it's because of the way the FDA has decided that stem cell therapy, in, in many cases, is a drug instead of medical practice, it's driven off the best stem cell research offshore. So if you want the best stem cell treatment, you need to go to the Caribbean or elsewhere, and we have some ALS patients actually so frustrated that they're making the drugs that are in testing with the pharmaceutical industry, they're making them in their kitchen, which of course <laughs> is very dangerous, you know, but, but they're desperate, right? Just like the AIDS patients. Yeah, were. sure. So you can't blame them. Now, right to try is, is a wonderful thing. What it does is it lets terminally ill patients bypass the FDA, go directly to the drug companies and negotiate. Uh, some type of arrangement with a drug company so that they have access to a drug that's still in testing. The problem that I see with it is that the drug companies are going to be hesitant to work with patients because they're going to feel that if they go around the FDA, the FDA is going to be upset with them and will drag their feet in their approvals. So uh, the drug companies are going to be very, very hesitant to get involved in that program. Right. However, there's some hope. <laughs> um, there, there is another program coming along called Free to Choose Medicine that the Heartland Institute is promoting. And what happens is something very similar, except that once a free to choose medicine drug is given to a patient because of the negotiation between the drug company and the patient, that drug does not have to stay in the FDA's good graces as it does in the free to choose or as it does in the right to try track. Okay. So basically once the drug enters free to choose medicine track, it doesn't need to be approved. It can be sold to that patient and whichever other patients want it. It's totally out of the FDA's hands, so to speak. And so I envision that drug companies will, some drug companies will go that route. They, the drugs for free to choose medicine have to get to a certain place in the FDA approval process. They have to have the uh, animal studies done and they have to have the human safety studies done. And then one trial in what we call phase two, which is the beginning of the effectiveness. But basically that means about a third of the money that a drug company will spend getting a drug approved will be used to get it into the place where it could enter the free to choose medicine track. So I think that might be actually something that could be a very good way to get an alternative to the FDA. And so you think that, so you think that the FDA would then say, well, we're not going to penalize you for going through that process. Well, they might, but it's, it's, it's harder to penalize them early in the process than late oh, in the see. process. Okay. Yeah. Um, now I'm not saying it won't happen. I, I'm, I'm just thinking that that might work out a little better. In my book, I really advocate that we take the approval power away from the FDA. So that was my next question. Long, what, so yeah. what's your prescription for fixing all this, this mess that the 1962 amendments <laughs> caused? Well, you know, I'd, I'd like to be able to say, let's just do away with the amendments. But unfortunately, the FDA has gone to the courts enough that case law basically has would keep the amendments alive. 
And if, for example, this idea that a food becomes a drug if you make a health claim, that's been in the courts. It's been um, decided in the FDA's favor. So even if you did away with the amendments, that wouldn't help you in that respect. So I think you need to do away with the amendments, but also to do away with the case law, the only way to take care of that really is to take the approval power away from the FDA. So the FDA could certify drugs but not approve them. And the difference is that when the FDA puts its seal of approval on a drug, consumers can say, oh, okay, I'll wait till I see the FDA's seal of approval, or they can say, I'm not going to wait. And so they would be able to buy drugs that had not been given this FDA seal of approval. And there's other companies that would probably be certifying agencies also. And the good news about that is certifying agencies generally actually test the product. The FDA doesn't test any drugs. It just tells the uh, drug companies what tests it wants done, and then it looks over the data that's provided to them by the drug companies. So certification would encourage third-party testing, which, of course, is a much better way to go in terms of consumer protection. And so consumers could take the drugs at whatever stage of development that they wanted to, and you know, some people say, well, isn't it complex enough to to need something like the FDA? And the answer is no, because there's been consumer groups that have been very successful in, you know, telling the FDA which drugs work and which ones don't. For example, the Abigail Alliance studies cancer drugs. It's a consumer group, but it has told the FDA years in advance which cancer drugs are actually working and should be approved. It's done 40 of them so far, and it's been right every time. Every drug it's recommended for fast approval has eventually (laughs) been approved by the FDA. Meanwhile, people are dying because they don't have access to that drug because the FDA takes years after that recommendation to do the approval. And there's also groups that look at dangerous drugs and have recommended their withdrawal from the market years before the FDA has withdrawn them. So if consumer groups can do that, (laughs) certainly a scientific body could certify drugs and and give us some good indication of what's likely to work and be relatively safe because nothing works for everyone, nothing's safe for everyone, and, and give us that assurance that at least there's some reason to consider a drug. So how are these so the so are these like uh, concomitant studies are like right at the same time that they the these other organizations have them as well as the their clinical trials to the FDA is that is that how these other consumer groups are finding out about this before the FDA has made their decision uh, well all the drugs are actually I'm sorry all the drugs in development um, when they get to a certain stage in clinical development they actually report out at clin trials clinicaltrials.gov okay. And because those trials are listed, consumers that want to learn more can go directly to the drug companies or really the drug companies often report out how their trials are doing as a news release. So it's possible to look that over and sometimes even see the data. Okay. So these organizations are not doing their own, they're not doing their own clinical trials. They're, they're just looking through the data and they're coming to a decision faster than the FDA, essentially. Yes. And of course, they do get a lot of consumer feedback since the Abigail Alliance, for example, is okay. focuses on cancer treatments. You can, you can find uh, sites that where the cancer uh, patients are talking to each other about what they've had and how it's worked. You know, So right. today, right. we have instant communication. <laughs> it's not like it used to be. Yeah. <laughs> and, and oftentimes, consumers are very, very good at, at figuring out what's working and what isn't. Yeah, I don't do much correspondence anymore with uh, at my my quill. Um, so I guess that's pretty much sums it up there. And I I want to thank you for being on, and I highly recommend your book, Death by Regulation. It's really fascinating. The stories, obviously, well sourced. I mean, there's your bibliography is like a hundred pages long, I think, with all the citations of the papers and the news releases and all the uh, the documentation of these studies. And and there certainly is more as far as uh, if you want to get into, f- if someone wants to know more about how you came to the calculations as far as the lives and, and the years prevented. I mean, those studies are there as well. So we didn't obviously get into the details of that, but um, mm-hmm. 
it's a great book. I hope everyone has a chance to pick it up and read it. I think it, I think you learn a lot and I think, you know, it doesn't, it's it, on some levels, it's not unique to the FDA. And I think people probably need to recognize that too, that, that the, the incentives that happen with the FDA are not totally dissimilar as they are with any other government re- regulatory agency that we need to be more concerned about as well. So mm-hmm. probably to keep those things in mind. So thank you so yes. much for being on. And as always, everything will be in the show notes page at theparadox.com slash zero one zero. So zero ten. I made it to double digits. So this is so I I made it big time now. Um again, thank you, Dr. Ruart, for spending the afternoon with me. And thank you for having me on and a good day to all your listeners. Thanks for listening to the paradox. If you like what the doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher and share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash the paradox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com. <laughs>